What, what was that like going back over the course of your life, which you had, I mean, most people don't keep a, a diary since the day that they're 15 years old or however young you were. Like going back and reading that stuff, was that the first time that you'd sat down and, and read your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I write this in the book. I always write things down not to remember. I write things down so I can forget them, you know, so I can go, oh, jotted that down. Cool. Now I can forget it. And that's what I've been doing since I was 14. Um, but I mind you, you know, the early stuff at 14, I'm, I'm a 14 year old kid writing, going to my you know, for this reason that most people go to their diary to write about the shitty stuff, to write about, oh, you know, Gretchen broke up with me or, you know, Kathy Cook won't go out with me or this worked out or I got to second base last night or some kind of thing like that. And then in my early 20s, I had a time where I was kind of rolling, uh, catching a lot of green lights. I was in college. My relationships were good, man. I would think I... I was making a little money, had a little money in my pocket. Uh, and uh, I said, you know what, McConaughey, go write in your diary now while you're rolling. Go dissect this success you're having right now because you may get in a rut again, which I did, which we all do. And you can go back and look at what was I doing when I was rolling? Who was I hanging out with? Where was I going? What was I eating? What was I drinking? How was I seeing the world? So um, that was something that I was happy I, I've done through my life is try to write things down when things are going well, because another rut's always coming. And when you if you if you keep track and make a little bit of it, there's a science to some satisfaction. There's some habits that I have found that I've had that have helped me be more satisfied and they help me get out of some of those ruts. What? So I, I'm je- I'm very jealous that you've kept a diary for that long and you could go back and kind of read your own thoughts from each phase of your life. What phase of your life or what age did you look back on? You're like, ooh, kind of a loser or I'm embarrassed by that. Because I always think like yeah. of myself as 23, I'm like, you did not know anything and you thought you knew everything. Yeah, well, there was that was part of the, to answer your question a second ago, that was part of the, the fear of going back and looking at these diaries. I was like, man, I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be ashamed of this. I'm going to be see where I was an arrogant prick. And thought I was a know-it-all, but actually, you know, was silly as could be, or was was a foolish was foolish about it. And look, what happened in sitting down with the diaries and writing the book? A lot of the, sh- the shit that I thought I was going to be embarrassed about, I actually just laughed at myself. A lot of the stuff I thought I was going to be ashamed about, I actually forgave myself or found that oh, I had already made amends for that. And a lot of the stuff that I thought I I was arrogant about, I I, I was. And I was like, well, good for you at that age of thinking you were a know-it-all um, and you ended up stepping in shit because you thought you were a know-it-all. But look, you know what? You stepped in shit again and that was okay. So I'm glad you had the courage to think you were a know-it-all at that time because look at you, you ate shit <laughs> yeah. because you thought you knew it all. And that was good, you know? Yeah. Was, was there a specific thing that looking back over your diaries, you were like, man, I was, I was really wrong about that and it actually ended up working out, but not for the reasons that I thought it would. Um, let me think, man. I mean, do you guys read that Scorpion Spring story <laughs> where, where, where I go, I get this, I get offered this, uh, uh, I was, I was in Hollywood. I'd, I'd already done days confused and I was about a year where I wasn't getting work. I was getting the first call back, second call back, third call back, but I wasn't getting the, wasn't getting the job. And it's cause I was tight. I was a little, I was a little, I wouldn't take enough chances. Well, I get this blind offer to do this role. It's a one day role. It's, it's of this guy who's a, um, a, a drug runner down on the South border and the coyotes are going to bring over his drugs. And instead of pay for him, he's going to steal the drugs, kill them on, move on. Well, I get this bright idea in my head at the time that I'm not going to read the script. I'm not even going to read the scene. Uh, I'm going to go back to how I first learned acting. Dazed, confused, man. There were only three lines. I, they were just throwing me in the middle of scenes and I improvised and worked for three weeks. That's back when I was a natural, you know? And at this time in my life, when this happened, I was like trying to really study acting. I was like, forget this study and I'm going back. I'm not even reading the script, I'm not even reading the scene. So I show up on the set, having not read the scene. <laughs> and I said, I'm just going to be my man. I'm going to do what my man would do. All right. And right before we were about to say action, uh, this uh, PA comes by and goes, hey, you want to see the sides, Mr. McConaughey, and the sides of the of the scene that day? And I decide I want to see him. Looking back, probably because I was getting a little insecure about this grand plan I had, right? Well, I open up the sides, I look at them. There's one page, two page, three page, four pages of a monologue <laughs> in Spanish. 
<laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit, man. And I felt this <laughs> bead of sweat come up on the back of my neck. And I'm like, can I get 12 minutes? And I don't know why I said 12 minutes. I remember in my mind at the time, I thought 12 minutes would be like not enough time to inconvenience the crew, but en enough time for me to go learn four pages of a monologue in Spanish because, hey, I took Spanish one semester in the 11th grade. Yeah, yeah. great. Well, guess what? Neither that, I did not, It was not enough time to learn it in Spanish. I've never seen that movie. I went back and did the take and was fucking embarrassed about that man it was uncomfortable i was stressed i felt horrible about it and that actually that moment is when i said okay bullshit from now on, i'm gonna over prepare i'm gonna out prepare people i'm gonna come in so prepared for scenes that you can call, call an audible put a blindfold on me wherever you want to drop me off in the world press record i'll be my man and that 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 embarrassing moment uh is what made me really understand that hey you gotta prepare to be free you gotta do the early work so you can do the early work so you can play on the day by the way you told a great you know story I'm in your memoir uh about your brother pat who was adopted and your parents said every year like let's you know go see your adopted you know your birth your birth parents and he said no 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 yeah. and then when he was 19 he's like all right let's go do it he shows up he goes inside meets him comes back out in two minutes and your parents are like, what's going on, Pat? And he's like, I just wanted to make sure my dad wasn't going bald because I'm starting to, my hair starting I'm to starting get lose my hair. <laughs> and that was it. They, they, that was the only time he saw his birth parents. That's it. That's cool. Never see him again. All right, that's cool. That was cool. That's cool. That's very. Yeah, that's good. that's really cool. Uh, one of the coolest things that you wrote in this book was a story about when you when you traded in your truck. You thought you had all the answers at that point. Yeah. You realized very quickly that you didn't. I, I actually think that story. It's a it's a nice allegory, not just in sports but in life. But if you want to like kind of give the background of what you learned from that, I think that's really yeah. really interesting. Yeah. So let's this this is a good topic on cool too on what's cool and what's not cool. Um, so I got a truck in in high school. I'm the guy who parks in the first parking lot. I got a speaker down in the grill in the front of the truck in the morning when all the students are going up to the come um, to class through the first parking lot. I'm the guy that's down there going, oh, look at Kathy Cook's jeans this morning, looking good, you know? And everyone turns around and go, where's that coming from? And Kathy Cook gets embarrassed and we all laugh. Then I pop up and they know it's me and we're all having fun. I'm the guy that danced at the party. I'm the guy that no matter what time we got to the concert, I'm gonna work my, we're gonna take my date. We're gonna work our ass up to the front row and go rock. Well, I'm driving down the road one day in my truck and I go by this Nissan dealership and I see this candy red 300 ZX sports car. I said, I just got to pull in there, man, and have a look at that. Well, it was hot shit. And then the guy was really motivated to sell it. And I never had a sports car. And on the spot, I traded him in my truck for that red 300 ZX. Cut to the next day. I'm not parking in the first parking lot. I park in the third parking lot. So, you know, nobody opened the doors and dent my candy red ZX, man. I'm also noticing that I think my car is such hot shit that I'm just gonna get out and lean against that son of a bitch and just be cool and go look at me and my new red 300 ZX with T-tops. How cool am I? You became a dork. Well, the girls got <laughs> disinterested, huh? You became kind of a dork when you got the cool car. Became kind of a dork, relying on my car. Yeah. You know, looking in the proverbial mirror at myself, letting wanting my car to do the work for me. Yeah. Well, the girls got pretty disinterested pretty quickly. And when I'm saying in the after school, you want to go ride around with me and my red 300 ZX with the T-tops down, they're like going, no, we're going to go mudding with Trey Hickman like we used to do with you. <laughs> well, after about a month and a half, things dry up for me, man. The chicks are not digging me and my red sports car that I'm leaning against in the third parking lot. And I realized, dude, you, 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 you coup de grace yourself. You outfoxed yourself. <laughs> this fucking red sports car is just talk about it's blue balling you, man. You, you got to get rid of this son of a bitch. So I went down and traded it in back in for my truck, drove my truck back to school the next day, parked in that first parking lot, got on my megaphone, started chasing and being the fun guy again, engaged. And I was back in with the girls. That fucking red sports car almost screwed me for a while, man. I love it. But that was one of those deals. I was trying too hard. I, was letting, I wasn't working. I wasn't hustling. I quit hustling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I got the red sports car. I thought I could do the work. I think it's a, it's a great story. It reminds me of I what we talked about on this show with Ryan Fitzpatrick and, and the Dolphins. You could put two in right now. He's your sports car, but Ryan Fitzpatrick's fun. He's a truck. He's good. You never know what you're going to get yes. with him. Don't take Ryan Fitzpatrick away from us just yet. 
run him until he's got 300,000 miles on him, then go get that sports car out. Right, right.